I started special care nursery in, at Cardinal Glenner Children's Hospital in 1963. And we were instrumental in, we helped invent the ventilator. We invented how to take blood pressure on premature babies. We, we were the ones that invented nutrition in the vein. Uh, we identified the need for magnesium, the need for zinc, the need for copper. Wow. And, and uh, we did with metabolic beds. We did every, every intake and output and did these things. So we were a leader in the field of neonatology. The hospital still is a leader in the field of neonatology. But then I had a baby, Joseph, in 1975, who had flat brain waves and was said to be brain dead. And uh, uh, it was suggested to stop treating him. I said, well, I don't do that. I treat babies, some live, some die, and kept treating him. And uh, he did eventually get off the ventilator, and he went to school, and he got straight A's. And, and tramp and play baseball and he's married he has three children so because of him after about six months when he continued to live and was doing much better than anybody would have predicted i started to investigate brain death and uh, um, it, it took about two years till i understood the language of brain death uh, uh, brain death is is a lie uh, it, it's a, a, a lie that's been told over and over again, so people don't even realize it's a lie anymore. But it, it's been a lie from the beginning, continues to be a lie. So um, uh, I've published in, in the medical literature, I have an article in the uh, in Journal of the American Medical Association. I have an uh, article in the Gonzaga Law Review. It's 85 pages. It has 244 footnotes to it. And, and uh, uh, because of that, eventually I have uh, continued to um, uh, talk about brain death. Brain death is a lie. I have talked all, all over the United States. I've, um, I've talked in many countries and, and um, uh, on, on this subject and continue to uh, do it and that's because of uh, different things that's how I got to meet uh, Ted Fogel. Uh, I didn't meet him myself but but through his cousin who uh, who's a physician and listened to what I had to say as we went to a football game and she said you, you should know my cousin so that's how I can get involved with this but the the Truth is easy, and and then once you deviate from the truth, then you ha have first it's this false, but then when people become conscious of this false, then it's a lie. Brain death is a uh, is a lie. The way it occurred was that Christian Bernard did the first heart transplant in South Africa in 1967. Mm -hmm. Three days later, they did the second heart transplant, and you don't know where that is, but I'll tell you. It was done in Brooklyn, New York, and what what they did is they cut the beating heart out of a three-day-old baby and transplanted it into an 18-day-old baby. And at the end of their surgeries, a short time after the end of their surgeries, both of those babies were dead. It was illegal. It was immoral. And so they had to do something to make it legal. And so what they did is they set up a committee at Harvard and the committee invented brain death. Uh, the committee did not do studies on dogs or cats or rats. They didn't collect data on human beings. They just invented brain death. And they had no patient data. They had no basic science studies. And, and, and I know it's really awful when you know about it. And it doesn't get better. It keeps getting worse after that. Then uh, uh, a lot of people think that Brain death means flat brain waves. They're not even required to do brain wave testing. The way they did that, they, they studied nine patients and two of the nine still had brain wave activity. And then they concluded no longer is it necessary to look at brain waves. So it's not required to look for brain wave activity. So when they're doing the, the transplantation on people they say are, are brain dead, they're, they're all going alive. To they're all alive yeah. and completely recoverable. They're all alive. You cannot. So they're harvesting organs out of people who are who are in some way conscious. They just can't communicate. 
Well, consciousness... When they feel pain. Consciousness and pain. Uh, uh, I encourage you to, uh, uh, to uh, sharpen your mind so that you uh, stay focused on one issue or the other. Sure. Okay, and consciousness is important, but but uh, um, it's one thing uh, not to demonstrate consciousness, and then we use words like unconscious, but unconscious does not mean that there's no consciousness. It just means that we do not observe consciousness, and there's a difference. So it's, a sub, it's, it's a, like subjective right. observation. Right, and whether a purpose, whether a person uh, shows consciousness or not does not indicate whether they're alive or dead. Gotcha. See, and so, so uh, uh, and, and uh, you use consciousness, and what else did you use? Pain, that they oh, feel pain, pain when, yeah, when they see, take the organs out. The pain is, um, is one of those things that's real, and we should pay attention to it, but pain is the way that body t the body uh, knows that something's wrong, and it's the way that healing is initiated. Now, we live in a world where no one should have any pain. Uh, well, there are some sayings, no pain, no gain. Right. And, and, and uh, every... Pain-free is, is not exactly a good thing. It, in fact, the matter is, it's a bad thing. So, so focus on pain. Now, here's what happens. It, uh, just because a person can't demonstrate pain doesn't mean they don't have pain. You know, a very good example of that is they, they give paralyzing agents uh, uh, when they take the organs so that they don't move and they don't oh, squirm. So horrible. And, and even if they don't move and don't squirm, when they cut on them, their heart rate goes up and their blood pressure goes mm -hmm. up. And, which is the response to pain, and but they can't demonstrate that they have pain because they're paralyzed. They medically they're paralyzed, paralyzed them, yeah. so they can't respond by. Right. Oh, and, that's horrible. 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 And it gets really bad if you pay attention to it. So, in any event, they in, in, invented brain death to mainly to get organs but then also so they don't waste money on treating people who aren't ever going to get a job, who, who are just going to live and, and not die. And so to see what brain death is, it's primarily a way to get organs. No, it's no different than what they did in Germany. It's exactly what they did in Germany. It's exactly what they did in Germany. And, and, and actually, um, in my research many years ago, uh, when you had to do the research by going to what we call the stacks in the library to get the old, the old journals, and I found articles in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1919, 1920, of a doctor in Germany who wrote to the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association and telling them what the doctors were doing in Germany. He signed it, the overseas correspondent, and told the uh, doctors in the United States what was going on in Germany, and that was before Hitler. So, so in many ways, what's going on in this country is very similar to what was going on then. And it took World War II to stop those doctors. But then what happened was that their records all went to the Russians. But no, I thought that with, through the, the Operation Paperclip, that the doctors, we brought the German doctors to the United States. Some of them came to the United States. Very few of them got charged with anything. Very, very few of the German doctors. And the German doctors were already in, involved in doing evil things. Uh, uh, before Hitler. Uh, remember I told you in 1920, Hitler didn't come into power until 1933 or 34. And, and uh, Hitler was elected, by the way. Okay. Sure. Yeah. He was elected and then became the dictator. Uh, um, and so, so, yes, it is very similar to what was going on in, in Germany. And, that was, and it was the German doctors. Uh, and I'm not opposed to doctors for lots of reasons, and I'm, I'm, 
uh, excited about many of the advances that have happened in medicine. But there's the, a fine line, though. There's a, there's a, an ethical an ethical and a moral line, right. however, in, and, in a practice. And the ethical and moral line, you know, those are rooted in words. And, you know, one is Greek and the other is Latin, and they they are very similar in the in the sense that they both revolve around how one ought to behave, and ought is a very special word. It, it, it's rooted in the word owe. So it's how, how the doctor ought to behave because he owes it to his patient to behave in a certain way. So ethics and morals. And so what they've done to that, and like when I went to college into medical school, I learned ethics. So what, and I also studied biology. So, and biology is a study of living things. Ethics is how one ought to behave. So what they've done is put together bioethics, and they're like water and oil. They don't mix. You can't mix when you're studying what, what's already set in place, that's biology, with something with how one ought to behave. So you put them together and you get something that you can do anything you want with it, and yes, they do. There is actually no meaning behind that. <laughs> no, but bioethics do is, what you will. <laughs> is, is a, a, a field that they are not ethicists and they're not biologists. They, they are people who are trained to carry out something. And, and the, the way that brain death works is that they, they get the clergy and the people in pastoral care uh, and, and uh, to get involved. And then in, in organ transplants, they have a designated requester. And the designated requester is usually a very nice person who dresses nice and, and befriends the relatives. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Oh, I know this has to be terrible on you. We'll do everything we can to help you. And all of that is part of getting them indoctrinated to get their yeah to get their organs. And See, and you cannot get any you cannot get any organs from a cadaver. Every organ that's transplanted is a healthy organ, and you can only get healthy organs from living persons. You cannot get any organs for transplant from a cadaver. That's why you don't put it on your license. And the things I'm telling you is that you you are not allowed to hear, uh, uh, and because if you hear it, you will be upset, as you all three of you are upset, and rightly so, you should be upset because uh, um, whose organs do they want? They want the organs from the uh, for, certainly from all children, but especially the people who are 16 to 30, and their life is in jeopardy. If they're unconscious and on a ventilator, they're going to get their organs, and they do everything to get their organs. And, and uh, once the organs are taken, you can't bring them back to life, and so that what they do is they tell the relatives, well, you, you know, your, your, your daughter Sally would really like to do something good and this is a way to make something good out of this tragedy and and uh, or your son and the while they have been getting organs from uh, accidents and gunshot wounds they now get more organs from overdose of drugs than they do from accidents and gunshot wounds combined there are eight deaths a day from overdose in Ohio and and they they get their organs is, is what they want and and so what are they doing they're giving the policemen the narcan to counteract the drug which gets them into the emergency room but it doesn't save their life it gets them in the emergency room and they still get their organs and so it's so diabolically disgusting oh it really is see sense. it's so bad it's so, it makes sense. And, I can't aim. oh my god now, just part of part of why I um, uh, when you were on talking about unconscious and pain, and you might have talked about something else. What I'm encouraging you to do is to realize that 
that there are common denominators of all of this. The common denominator is that each person is unique and unrepeatable and special. And a person is, is alive, uh, uh, but uh, so are the dogs and cats running around that are alive, and so are the trees alive, but they don't have the life that the person has. And each person has that life, whether that person can walk or talk or show consciousness. In brain death, they, they do only three things for brain death. One is the, the patient does not show consciousness. The patient does not have brainstem reflexes that, that involve the eye or the ear. So there's about 14 brainstem reflexes, but they test only six. They don't test the others. And then the, the test that they do that uh, is called the apnea test. It's really not a test, it's a procedure. And what they do is take the ventilator away uh, for 10 minutes. And the patient has to demonstrate that they can take a breath in that 10 minutes. So that becomes the signal to cut out their organs. During the time they're off the ventilator, the carbon dioxide builds up, the acids build up, that makes the brain swell worse and makes them get worse. So everybody must learn to not do an apnea test. You almost learn it now. And, and you have to know it. I hope you never have to use it on your relatives, but you need to learn it. Do not do an apnea test. No one should ever have the procedure of an apnea test. And then uh, you, you ha have to know that the overdose of drugs, they need time to heal. You know, right now, and I got a text as I was coming in from the father of a girl in Canada, Takesha, uh, McKitty, you, you can Google her if you want, Takesha McKitty. Uh, uh, um, I, was, I, gave, I was talking in New York and I was going to New Jersey the next day and they called me and asked me if I would um, um, help with Takesha. So I went to Canada to help her. Uh, uh, she overdosed on September the 14th. On September the 20th, they issued a death certificate on her. Uh, she's still very much alive. She moves her feet. She moves her legs. Um, you know, and, I mean, I could... But she has a death certificate? She has a death certificate. She has a death certificate on September the 20th, and the, this is uh, uh, December the 5th. You know, and she's right. still alive? She's still alive, yes. But With they, a death certificate. But she could have had her organs cut out on September the 20th, but by going sure. there, put a stop to that. So she was not dissected. Every... Everybody who um, who has their organs taken, they're all dissected alive. There's no organs you can get from a cadaver.